On today's show, I'll share with you why I have never had more confidence in De'Aaron Fox than I do right now. Plus, we'll discuss our overall confidence level in the Kings' second unit. And Bleacher Report put out a hypothetical Kings trade involving the Brooklyn Nets that has me very intrigued. I'll explain right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On King. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off-season long. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, which will help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And before we get to any Anything Sacramento Kings, there's something I have to do. <laughs> oh, the Los Angeles Lakers got rejected. Dan Hurley said, you know what? I'd rather stay at UConn where I can actually win things than to go to Los Angeles and be a part of the next leg of the Los Angeles Lakers trying to hold on for dear life with their yesterday's players. No disrespect to, to, to LeBron James. No disrespect to Anthony Davis. They've got some of the greatest players ever to play the game on that roster. Foster, but their time is past. The time of the NBA now belongs to the Anthony Edwardses of the world, to the Shea Gilgis Alexanders, to the Luka Doncic's. The LeBron and AD era of greatness is essentially over. Dan Hurley sees the writing on the wall. He's won two back to back national championships with the Yukon Huskies. The money ain't worth it to come to Hollywood to be at the helm of a sinking ship. So <laughs> uh, any uh, any Lakers struggles is always happy for us here on the Locked on Kings podcast. Anyway, now that we've gotten that out of the way, now that I'm done being petty, let's talk about De'Aaron Fox. I've been teasing this podcast for weeks, right? Why do I have more confidence in De'Aaron Fox right now going into next season than I ever had before. And I was sitting, before I even thought about this as a podcast, I was having a conversation with a number of actually friends of mine when talking about the Sacramento Kings. And I think it's a fair question still to question if De'Aaron Fox can be a superstar on a championship team, right? I don't think he's done enough to 100% prove that he is that guy. It's fair to acknowledge that while also having confidence in his ability to get there. He's not there yet, but in my opinion, there's no reason to believe that he can't get there and he can't be that guy. So after I had that conversation with those guys, I, I, I went home And I was thinking about it more and more. I was thinking, why do I feel so confident in De'Aaron right now? The Kings just missed the playoffs. De'Aaron, believe it or not, even though it felt like the Kings dealt with more injury issues last season than the season before, De'Aaron actually played more games last season than the season before. He had his incredible start to the season. His slump in the middle of the season ended on a high note. We know what happened uh, in in the play-in tournament, but he was very good against the Golden State Warriors to help eliminate them uh, from the play-in in Sacramento. So... Putting all of this together and thinking about all of it, plus his circumstances with his contract and everything, I just came up with a list of reasons for why I feel like De'Aaron's going to play his best season and go into the best season of his career. And more importantly, he's going to lead the Sacramento Kings further than they've ever gone before, I should say under in in his era um the furthest they've ever gone since like the Chris Webber era I think is what's going to happen this season led by De'Aaron Fox and one of the immediate reasons for that actually has a lot to do with his teammates Keon Ellis is the first name that comes to mind Keon and I think this this Kings defensive system that they figured out and established in the final third of last season that there's no reason to believe it's not going to carry over into this year. They have their defensive focus. They know they can play a physical brand of basketball, and they feel that they can replicate it and play that way for an entire 82-game regular season, whether it's game one in October, 
game 40-something in January or the end of the season around playoff time. They believe that the way they, they, they played defensively to end last season can be who they are night in and night out. That takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of De'Aaron Fox. Two seasons ago, the Kings were making their push and finally ending the playoffs, uh, playing the playoff the dr- drought, excuse me. Fourth quarter time, and a large portion of the game before that, but especially fourth quarter time, if there was a star guard on the opposing roster, and pretty much every team in the league has a star guard, De'Aaron Fox was the guy guarding him. Not out of just sheer competitiveness and willpower from Fox, although that definitely existed, because the Kings needed him to. Their only other similar on-ball defender was Davion Mitchell. But Davion Mitchell, at that time, was really struggling to find his fit, especially on the offensive end of the floor. Remember, we're talking about two seasons ago when the Kings led the league in offense. So offense was their identity, right? De'Aaron was the guy guarding Steph. De'Aaron was the guy guarding Dame. De'Aaron was the guy guarding Kyrie. That was his job out of necessity. The Kings needed him to do it. At the end of last season, they could throw Key on. They could still throw Fox when they wanted to, and Fox asked for it from time to time. They could throw Davion. Like the Kings now, at least before they make any changes to their roster, and I'm of the belief that they will make defensive improvements to their roster this offseason. They have to. But even as the roster stands right now, there are more options defensively for Sacramento that take some of the pressure off of De'Aaron's shoulders. That serves two purposes. One, for a a game-by-game basis, that opens up De'Aaron to focus more on the offensive end of the floor where he is a great, right? Or where if the Kings are going to get a superstar caliber De'Aaron Fox or an MVP caliber De'Aaron Fox, it's going to be scoring the basketball amongst his his other things. But the Kings, I think, need Fox to continue to elevate himself to that superstar caliber score. And we saw it in flashes last season, but not through an entire season, right? Taking some of his load off on the defensive end night in, night out helps him to do that. But from the full grand scale and grand scheme of things, to have him still be a large part and take a lot of the responsibility for how the Kings are going to play defense, but for not for him to not necessarily be the foundation or the focal point or the workhorse on the defensive end every single night, I think that helps his durability. And more importantly, I think that helps that gap in the season that he's had consistently in his career. Right, we've mentioned the hot starts, we've mentioned the the, the hot uh, finishing to seasons, but in the middle of the season, typically we'll see De'Aaron slump a little bit. Whether it's because of fatigue, it's because of he's he's banged up, which a large portion of the season Fox plays banged up and bumped and bruised, just because of kind of the kind of player that Fox is. But those middle, those dog days of the season months, De'Aaron t- typically takes a step back a little bit. I think a portion of that is because of fatigue. If he's getting more defensive help across the board from his teammates and has guys like Keon Ellis that he can line up with every single night and Keon is responsible for taking the primary defensive role for the majority of those minutes, that could, I think I mean I don't see a way that that doesn't help DeAaron Fox play at a more consistent high level for the course of 82 games. I think a big portion of uh, a big reason why I'm so confident in De'Aaron too is last season we saw the true emergence of De'Aaron's three point game, right? But there were still portions of the season where it felt De'Aaron was over reliant on the three point shot. Then there were games where he didn't shoot it enough. It felt like Fox realized like he 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 added this tool to his bag, right? But he was trying to figure out how to most effectively use it. His three-point percentage went up from 32% to 37%. His volume increased from five threes a game to just shy of eight, 7.8 three-point attempts per game. Now it's about finding the balance, not just as a three-point shooter, but as a three-level scorer. Because when he won Clutch Player of the Year two seasons ago, he was lethal at the mid-range. And he kind of took a dip with his mid-range shooting because of the elevation of his three-point shot. He also hasn't been getting to the rim and finishing around the rim as much as he did to start his career. I think a large portion of that, too, is because he gets clobbered every time he goes to the rim and doesn't get to the foul line as much as he should. 
But Fox truly adding that three-point shot to his game and having a year of it under his belt, plus another offseason to work with Luke Lautz, who's largely responsible for the elevation of that three-point shot, I think Fox will have a better understanding of how to use that three-point shot and how to build it into his... I mean, his ability to be a three-level scorer, an unguardable three-level scorer at the NBA level is right in front of him. Like he said, and he's right, he can get whatever shot he wants. There are certain defenders in the league that are going to work hard to stay in front of him. They definitely exist. But Fox should be basically unguardable because he can beat you at all three levels. He just has to find a way to be most effective at all three levels and not sacrifice one for the other on any and every given night. I think the recommitment to Mike Brown matters a lot to De'Aaron Fox as well. One, because Fox, when he, early in his first season working with Mike Brown, he talked a lot about how he finally has a coach that's coaching him the way he wants to be coached, right? But think about what Fox has been through in his career here in Sacramento. He's been through a lot of coaching changes. He's been through inconsistencies throughout the organization. So while we, as a fan base, are relieved to see a coach get a second contract for the first time in damn near 20 years. Imagine how relieved he is as the guy that's working with that coach every day to see, okay, we've made progress. We're moving in the right direction. This organization committed to someone that I believe in and therefore by proxy committed to me and what we're doing here. I think that matters to Fox. Now, I'm not in De'Aaron's head. I don't know De'Aaron personally to the level where I can text him or, or, or have a, a, a psychological conversation with him and get an idea of how much that matters to him and how much that matters to his family. But I have to imagine that his roots are dug here in Sacramento, not just as a player who is committed to playing in front of this fan base and com- committed to playing in Sacramento and really worn Sacramento on his sleeve from the second he was drafted here. I mean, he's got a family here. He's got his lovely life, wife, Rose, Rain, and then they just announced that they're uh, they're having their second child together, right? Fox's roots are here in Sacramento. He's committed to this city. I think it also helps him to fight as hard as he can for this city on a nightly basis when he sees the organization that he's working for kind of shed some of their past, continue to move away from what they were, and commit to a guy that he supports, that supports him, and that is ultimately trying to get this team out of their dark, historic past. So I think Mike Brown getting a contract extension does really matter to De'Aaron Fox, and I think we'll see the way he plays and the way he approaches his game uh, be a positive reflection of that. He's got two seasons remaining on his deal. This is important. The Sacramento Kings did make an offer this season to extend his contract. He ultimately turned it down. It's not because he has second thoughts about playing for the Sacramento Kings. It's because, well, that we know of. It's because money, right? He's eligible to make a lot more money. How does he do that? Well, he's now going into his eighth season in the league. So a max contract is based upon your seniority, essentially. So between your first six seasons in your first six seasons in the league, a max contract that you're el- eligible for is 25% of the cap. Of course, we know the cap is going to continue to go up and up and up and up, especially with a new TV deal coming. De'Aaron Fox knows with that alone, a higher percent, uh, the, the the cap getting higher means more chunk of change that he's eligible to get. But because he's now past his sixth year, he's in going into season eight, he's now eligible for a max contract at base 30%. Of the cap. I should say max 30% of the cap. However, more can be added on top of that based off of your performance. That's where we talk about making the all NBA team. That's why Anthony Edwards and, and um, uh, Tyrese Halliburton are going to each make $45 million more total on their deals because they both made all NBA teams this year. Granted, they're signing their second deals. De'Aaron Fox will be signing his third, I think. So you have. The all-NBA opportunities, you can also get paid for winning the MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, stuff like that. That's a little less likely, I think, than all-NBA. But regardless, you have the cap going up with the new TV deal, and the cap's going to keep going up every single year. So he gets 30% of whatever the cap is at the time that he resigns, plus potentially another all-NBA nod that adds more money to what he can make. So I say all that to say... De'Aaron Fox's payday and the money that he makes is performance-based. 
the better he performs, the more money he can potentially get. I don't know how much money is a motivating factor for De'Aaron. I have to imagine, like all of us, he wants to make more money if it's available to him. So if you add that to, there's the competitiveness factor of wanting to win. There's the loyalty factor of re-signing Mike Brown. And now you have the financial factor of the better I play, the more money I'm eligible to make uh, in a, a couple of seasons or whenever they decide to uh, to make that extension. Finally, to me, there's absolutely no question about the competitiveness of De'Aaron Fox. He's a competitive dude. That comes out in his trash talking on the floor. And that comes out in his leadership style, which is a lead by example style. Now, there are fair questions to be asked about De'Aaron as a leader. Fair questions, 100%. We've been asking him really his entire career here in Sacramento. Do the Kings need more of a vocal leader than De'Aaron's willing to be? But De'Aaron's leadership is by example. That's certainly not a bad trait to have, and it certainly is is easy, easier for some teammates and some guys to follow De'Aaron when he's willing to do the work, especially on the defensive end, right? If the Kings are trying to commit to giving 110% on defense every possession, all 24 seconds of the shot clock, every single night. If De'Aaron Fox isn't willing to do it, why the hell would the rest of the ro- roster be? But De'Aaron is. He's a leader by example. His competitiveness, he wants to win 100%. Never in doubt. Fox knows that this team is close. And he made that apparent through his, uh, his his comments at the end of the season. I was in New Orleans. I was in New Orleans after they lost to the Pelicans for the sixth time in the same year, and they were eliminated from playoff contention, and Fox was disappointed. Some people have problems with Fox's aloofness after games. He does Sometimes he wears his emotions on his sleeve. He used to do that years ago, and people didn't like that at that time. Now De'Aaron Fox has more kind of an aloofness of like, it's over, it's done with, I got to move on. Some people have a problem with that. But De'Aaron's comments that night were, we're not a bad team. Like, we weren't a bad team. We won 46 games. The West just was what it was, and we had an unfortunate injuries. We lost some games at times that were timely mistakes. So De'Aaron knows this Kings team is close. I think De'Aaron is also aware that in addition to roster improvements, he has to be better. He said as much. He needs to be better. And the Kings taking that next step towards ultimately contending, a lot of that falls upon his shoulders to take that next step in his career. I was talking to uh, Chris Biederman recently from the Sacramento Beat, covers the Sacramento Kings. Does a great job. Good friend here of the podcast. And Chris and I were talking about how some players like are, 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 are psychotic. Like they're sociopaths. And in, in the way that, like Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan was a freak. Kobe Bryant was a freak. Like they were like, I will not let you beat me. Like I am so competitive, almost to an unhealthy level, that I'm driven to do whatever it freaking takes to win. I think it's fair to question whether or not De'Aaron has that element. Is he motivated by his family off the court? Is he motivated by other things other than just purely winning and beating the guy in front of him? But I do believe that De'Aaron cares wholeheartedly about winning, that his goals are set on a title and not just being a perennial playoff team and collecting a pay paycheck and being the man here in Sacramento. I don't think that's enough for him. Again, I haven't had this conversation with him, so I can't say for sure. I'm just based off of my working around him and covering him his entire career. I think I have a decent idea of what his motivations are, plus talking to other people about him who know him better than I do. You put all that together, his competitiveness, the financial aspect, Mike Brown coming back, his three-point shot, the defense, and his teammates' ability to help take some of that defensive load. I have full, I, I've i never, truly never been more confident in De'Aaron Fox this next season. I think we're going to see another level of De'Aaron. We saw the burst of it at the beginning of last year where he was averaging 30 points a game and he was scoring with the best of the best in the league. I think what we saw at the start of last season, we're going to see for the majority of of next season. And like I said before, and like we saw in the playoffs two years ago, when Fox gets to that stage, he will shine. He will shine. He did. He will. He can still get better. And that should be scary for the rest of the league. 
Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not burning cash. With all the parts that you need, the prices that you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home some huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. I remember last offseason when we knew for the most part that the Kings were going to be running it back. They made some Additions, Chris Duarte, Sasha Vizenkov, JaVale McGee, and it was all in the interest of improving the Kings' second unit, improving that bench unit. It's fair to say, outside of Malik Monk, the Kings' bench unit was inconsistent, except for they were consistently disappointing, right? I did not, I was not pleased and not happy more often than not with how the bench unit played. The Kings were heavily, heavily reliant on their starters, pretty much on a nightly basis, which... There's a certain level of understanding to that, but your bench unit is important, how impactful they are. When the Kings got good uh, input from their bench and good performances from their bench, typically they won, right? And they should be getting that, I think, more often than they got last season. So we're taking, I want to take a look at the Kings' current bench unit. These guys aren't guaranteed to be here next season, but we're going to look at this current bench unit and we're going to talk about which guys we have confidence in that we think are trustworthy and which guys we don't necessarily trust. Let's start with the trustworthy guys. The first one that jumps off the page, and I don't need to talk about him more than 10 seconds, is Malik Monk. I'm of the belief that if Malik Monk comes back, there's a very, very good chance that Malik will be a starter. I'm of the camp that I think Malik just should be a starter and you figure out how to stagger your rotations to where you can still get him a lot of room with that second unit if you need to. If Mike still feels and if Malik's okay re-signing in Sacramento and still coming off the bench and competing for the sixth man of the year that he should have won twice by now, if he's okay with that, so be it. I don't know what his motivations are. But whether it's coming off the bench or starting, I'm 100% okay with Malik Monk, right? Trey Lyles. Trey Lyles had a disappointing year. He spoke last summer about how eager he was to return to the Sacramento Kings and the Kings brought him back on a two-year deal. Unfortunately, he dealt with some nagging injuries a lot last season. Started the season with the, I think it was an ankle injury, um, got banged up again in the middle of the season. Trey never was at the level and got to the level where he was at the year before. That being said, he's still in my trustworthy category. Like, Was Trey good enough last season? No. Is Trey good enough to be the sixth man on a championship team? I don't think so. But seventh or eighth option? Absolutely, Trey Lyles is a a good guy for that spot. I also think Trey Lyles is capable of helping this Kings team win in the postseason. He's versatile. He fits well with what the Kings do. He spaces the floor. He can rebound the basketball. He can put the ball on the floor and attack the basket when he wants to. I think I, I trust Trey Lyles. He's going into one last year of his career. I know I've brought his name up in hypothetical trade talks, especially with the Washington Wizards for Kyle Kuzma because he's an expiring deal. That's not because I want to move Trey Lyles. That's because Trey has an expiring contract. And the Kings don't have a whole lot of those. So if teams are looking for expirings, Trey's going to be one of the guys that's naturally brought up in those conversations. But it's not out of a desire to trade Trey Lyles. As long as Trey's a Sacramento King, I'm okay with that. Davion Mitchell changed for me. And I've been very, very transparent with this. I was not a believer in Davion Mitchell. In fact, a good portion of the way through last season, I was ready for it to be done. I thought the experiment was over. I thought, yeah, include Davion Mitchell in a trade package, either at the trade deadline or this summer. Get him out of here. It's not working. He does have value. He's a good defender. Use him and picks or whatever the hell you need to attach him to to go out and get an upgrade. I was of that belief. I thought the ship had sailed. Then the Kings figured something out. And by the Kings figuring something out, they also put Davion Mitchell in a significantly better situation to succeed. They gave him more consistent playing time. Mitchell found out how to be more effective on the offensive end of the floor. And because he was able to stay on the floor, we saw more of that defensive impact that off night is known for, right? So Davion Mitchell, if who he was at the end of last season, he doesn't even have to get that much better. Let's say like his career is nightly what he was for the Sacramento Kings to end last season. 
if that's the case, he's a trustworthy guy, and I'm happy to have him coming off my bench. Finally, Alex Len. Now, Alex Len is trustworthy within the realms and of his role. I don't think Alex Len is a guy that you're looking at to really be a massive bench piece on a championship team. But Alex Len is freaking reliable. You know exactly what you're going to get. He comes in and always stays ready. He gives you the exact same things. He rebounds. He sets really good screens. He doesn't necessarily block shots as much as maybe a big should. I don't know. But Mike Brown also doesn't value block shots, but he changes shots, right? He takes up room in the paint. He clogs the paint. He is a presence out there. He always stays ready. He's cheap. He's a hard worker. He's cheap, meaning he's, he's, his contract is not very expensive. I mean, as long as Alex Len is a member of the Sacramento Kings, I'm 100% okay with it, even if it's as a depth piece, even if he doesn't play for a large majority of the season. How, having a player like Alex that you can call on at any time, I think is reliable. I think that's why Mike Brown likes him. I think that's why the Sacramento Kings should have interest in keeping him around. There's only really two names on my untrustworthy talent list. I guess I could kind of add a third with Kessler Edwards, but I think we know what Kessler is. He's a good wing defender that struggles with consistencies of three-point shots and therefore is going to struggle to find consistent playing time. But he's not a a bad depth piece to have, and realistically, we know what to expect from him. Sasha Vazenkov and Chris Duarte... We have higher expectations than what they delivered. Of course, in the case of Sasha Vizenkov, we talked about a lot on the last podcast because there's conflicting reports now that the Kings have informed Sasha that they don't want him to come back and Sasha has informed the Kings that he doesn't want to come back. Whatever the situation, the reality is, the bottom line is, like the Sasha Vizenkov experiment hasn't worked and it sounds like both sides are recognizing that and in routes to a breakup. Sasha, whether he remains with the Sacramento Kings or not, there are too many question marks about Sasha on the defensive end of the floor. Offensively, he is gifted. I think the Kings misused him a lot at times, and he could have been better. That being said, is he reliable? Is he trustworthy? I don't know, because I really haven't seen enough yet. And I also know that Sasha is who he is at this point in his career. Late 20s, like he's not a young rookie or young second-year player. Who he is is who he is. And if that doesn't mesh with what Mike Brown and the Kings are doing, so be it. Chris Duarte is a young player, has dealt with injury issues that have held him back a little bit early on in his career. I know the Kings were very excited about bringing him in, as was I. Chris Duarte was a foul merchant on the defensive end of the floor. He fouled way too much. Offensively, he was very inconsistent with his three-point shot. And even though he had two different cracks during the preseason and the regular season at taking a starting spot, he never really could hold it because he wasn't good enough to hold it. I don't mind if either of those two guys are on the Kings roster next season. I do mind if either of those two guys are on the roster with the expectation that they're going to be an important part of the second unit. If they are, then the Kings second unit is not good enough. Then I have the could they work category. Harrison Barnes, Kevin Herter, and Colby Jones. I'm not going to talk about this as much as I wanted to. One, for timing purposes, and two, because I think this could be a completely different podcast by itself. So I'm just going to touch base on it very quickly And I'll go into more details in a future episode later this offseason. Do I think Harrison Barnes could work as a bench player? Absolutely. 100%. I think he'd be a valuable player to have off your bench. What does that role look like? That's to be determined. Do I think Kevin Herter could be a good bench player for the Sacramento Kings? I have more questions than I do about Harrison Barnes, except I know what Kevin Herter could bring off the second unit as that flamethrower three-point offensive option. I do have concerns about Kevin's overall fit in the Kings' defensive schemes, and I still feel that Kevin and Mike Brown are not necessarily on the same page. Not that they don't like each other or anything, but I don't think Kevin quite fits what Mike is trying to do with his rotations. So I still think it's more likely that Kevin is not on the team than he is on the team, but of course it takes two to tango, and you're not just going to give Kevin Herter away for nothing. If Kevin's role is as a bench player... As a volume three-point scorer off the bench, we know how hot he can get. He could shoot 50% for a month if he wants to. I think that's very valuable for the Sacramento Kings to have, and you can stagger him and when any lineups as you is that you want. You can have him out there with De'Aaron, have him out there with Domas, have him out there with Keegan. doesn't really matter. Uh, and then there's Colby Jones. Colby Jones, I, I, I believe in Colby Jones. I think... Measurement wise, I think skill set wise, I know he's a second round pick, so we have to be realistic in our expectations, but I think Colby Jones provides a lot of what the Kings need more of. I think Summer League and the California Classic is going to be really telling. 
if he comes out in the California Classic, comes out in Summer League and dominates, I'm not saying the same way that Keegan did when he had 40 and 50 points, but it, or almost 40 and 50 points. If Colby comes out and looks like one of the best, if not the best player on the floor in the California Classic and in Summer League, that furthers my confidence in his ability to actually be a part of this Kings rotation. I don't know if it'll be as early as next year, but I know for a fact the Kings see value in Colby, and I personally believe that Colby brings to the table a lot of what the Kings need more of. So if, if Colby's leaning towards any, I mean, he hasn't done enough to prove it yet, but I think I trust what Colby Jones can be more than I don't trust what he will be, if that makes sense. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality candidates and professionals that are right for your role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools that you need to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn is a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many qualified candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within just 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that the small businesses in our world are wearing so many hats and sometimes don't have the time or the resources to go through the hiring process. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make that process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making that process easier and quicker than ever before. Two and a half million million small businesses use LinkedIn jobs for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So really quick, hypothetical trades are always fun to do during the off season and Bleacher Report always has fun with these articles that they have. One hypothetical trade for every team to make this off season and of course, they always capture our attention. A lot of people react negatively to them. As someone who creates that kind of content, I understand that a lot of people don't like these conversations naturally, but they're intrigued by them because we all like to play general manager, right? We all like to put our GM hat on and try and make trades and improve our roster uh, from, from the safety of our couch with no real responsibilities or no real repercussions. So here is the hypothetical trade that Bleach Report came up with recently. The Kings would send Davion Mitchell, Chris Duarte, and a top 10 protected 2027 first round draft pick to the Brooklyn Nets for Dorian Finney Smith. Now, my first initial reaction to this was too much, right? To me, if you could either remove Davion and replace Davion with a worse player, or increase the pick protections, meaning it's lottery protected, top 15 protected, that's what I would look to do. Once we get past that, just talking about Dorian Finney-Smith, he's exactly the type of player that the Kings need. Exactly. Now, on a realistic level, he's not a superstar or anything like that. And the Kings could, of course, need a super. But the Kings are looking for players of Dorian Finney-Smith's size, archetype, and quality. A 6'7", versatile wing defender, who shot nearly 35% from three-point range this season, which was an increase over last season. He started 56 of 68 games. Dorian Finney-Smith would be fantastic for this Kings roster. And I think Bleacher Report is definitely on to something to where whoever put this trade together recognizes that this is what the Kings need, and those type of players are not easy to get. So while, again, my initial reaction is, God, Mitchell Duarte and a top 10 protected first round pick for Dorian Finney-Smith, that's a lot to give up. If the Kings are as desperate as I think they are and need to be in order to add wing defensive talent, it might be what they have to do. Now, granted, I still think that the Kings can get Kyle Kuzma for this year's first round pick and expiring contracts. I think it's very possible. So... This is a deal that doesn't have to be made on draft night. It could be made after draft night, after you get the context of any moves you try and make with 13. But you could also, I guess, I suppose you could make this trade on draft night if you wanted to and send 13 to to Brooklyn or make a selection for Brooklyn at 13. I I still feel like the Kings could get Dorian Finney-Smith for less, not a lot less, 
again, like replace Davion Mitchell with a slightly worse player or less uh, important player or increase the pick protections. I think you can get away with that. By the way, I think in this trade, like the if the, the pick in 2027 doesn't convey, then it turns into two second round picks, which I have no issue with. Yeah, like go ahead, take multiple seconds. I don't care. But Dorian Finney-Smith, man, he's enticing. He's a player that the Kings could absolutely use. He's a, a player that the Kings needed to add to their roster at the trade deadline this past season. It does leave the question, though. Like, does Dorian Finney-Smith replace Harrison Barnes as a starter? Because in this trade, Harrison's not involved in the deal. So if you're bringing Dorian, Dorian Finney-Smith over, and again, he started 56 of his 68 games for Brooklyn last year, do you move Harrison to the bench and start Finney-Smith next to Keegan Murray? Well, I think the way Keegan Murray plays offensively and develops offensively does have a large part of that conversation. But taking that out of it, Finney Smith is a similar age. He's a better defender than Harrison Barnes is, more reliable defender, 100%. But Harrison Barnes is a much more reliable offensive option. He averages about four more points per game than Dorian Finney Smith does, and he shoots 38% from three to Dorian's almost 35%. That's a big difference right? So offensively, I far more trust Harrison Barnes than I do Finney Smith, but defensively, which would ultimately be his goal as a 3 and D wing, I think he could be more consistently impactful for Sacramento than Harrison Barnes is. Personally, I think if if this trade went down, like let's say this trade actually happens, going into training camp, I think the expectation should be and would still be that it's Harrison Barnes' starting job. But Harrison can't go walking into training camp knowing that that spot is as secure as it's been basically every single year uh, of his career here in Sacramento. Like every year, the Kings have not really had any other option for Harrison to be threatened by for his starting spot. If the Kings had Dorian Finney Smith come into training camp with Harrison Barnes, Harrison's going to have to fight to keep that spot. I still think he would be the day one starter for the Sacramento Kings. And Finney Smith would be like a sixth or seventh man coming off the bench to be determined about Malik Monk. But I wouldn't. I don't hate the deal. I don't hate the idea of the deal. Also, by not trading Harrison Barnes and getting Dorian Finney-Smith, if you feel confident in Finney-Smith as a starter going forward, it opens up the door for a Harrison Barnes trade later on this offseason if you feel like making it. So, I like the idea. I like the idea of Dorian Finney-Smith in Sacramento. If you want to respond to your thoughts on that hypothetical Finney-Smith trade, your thoughts on the Kings' second unit, which guys you trust and don't trust, and... Your thoughts on what I had to say about De'Aaron Fox and your overall confidence level in Fox. How confident are you in the Kings star going into next season? Let me know. You can do so on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack. You can email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube, leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Appreciate your support as always. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. I'm going to be joined by JaVale McGee. Yeah. Sacramento Kings center JaVale McGee. He's been making the rounds of media tours, appeared on uh, 1140, Sacktown Sports, uh, appeared on multiple news stations. Now he's coming on Locked on Kings. He's supposed to join me on Wednesday. Hopefully everything works out because I'll have my interview with JaVale McGee coming a little bit later on this week. So I hope to see you then. My name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.